Okay guys, let's begin this video by looking at how a muscle cell or motor unit responds to a single action potential called a twitch. The latent period is a period in which the action potential finally arrives at the muscle fiber and the excitation um, coupling contraction occurs. This period includes the time in which the action potential um, starts the muscle contraction and it all runs all the way through the cross bridge cycle which we will definitely talk about. Keep in mind that skeletal muscle is, is responsible for powering um, voluntary movement. So first thing that happens is that an action potential um, is conducted down a neuron to the axon terminal. Here the voltage gated calcium channels open and calcium enters into the axon terminal going down its electrochemical gradient. The calcium ions then bind to synaptic vesicles, and the synaptic vesicles contain ac acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. Um, the acetylcholine migrates to the cell membrane and are released by exocytosis, as you can see. Then it binds to the, these nicotinic receptors, um, which are ionotropic on the motor end plate. The nicotinic cholinergic channels open, allowing um, sodium and potassium channels to open, which results in a graded potential called the end plate potential. It's graded, but it always results in an action potential. The action potential it travels down the cell membrane and all the way down the T-tubules, just like um, Luke in Star Wars. So these T-tubules are positioned right next to the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which contains a lot of calcium storage within the muscle cell. The action potential activates voltage-sensitive um, DHP receptors, which is connected to the riodine receptors. And so the DHP receptors go through a conformational change, in turn um, opens up the riodine channel, which releases calcium from the intracellular um, sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. Now begins the period of the cross bridge cycle which um, happens on the myofibrils which contain thin and thick filaments. Thin filaments include actin which has the binding site for myosin and another thin filament is troponin. Troponin has tropomyosin binding site, actin binding site, and calcium binding site. Then there's a tropomyosin which lies in the groove of the actin and basically just blocks the binding site for myosin. So, so now the calcium comes in and binds to the troponin which um, leads to a conformational change that drags the tropomyosin off of the actin site in order to expose the um, myosin binding sites. But now ATP is required in order to move the myosin off of that actin binding site. There are three primary means by which um, ATP can be regenerated. The first way is creatine phosphate, which acts as the energy reserve, but it's actually very inefficient and only lasts for 10 seconds. Also, there is glycolysis, which lasts for about a minute, um, but is very inefficient. Oxidative phosphorylation is the best way to... Um, sustaining the needs of ATP for an extended period of time because it uses um, oxygen and fatty acids or nutrients. The order of recruitment goes from um, slow oxidative fibers, then fast oxidative fibers, then fast glycolytic fibers. Um, the order of recruitment is related to the diameter of the nerve. Um, oxidative fibers actually have high resistance resistance to fatigue, whereas glycolytic fibers have low resistance to fatigue, which is probably why they're recruited first. They also contain um, myoglobin, which has oxygen. Now that we have ATP, it binds to the myosin, um, which removes it from the actin site, and the ATP splits into ADP and phosphate, and the myosin reconnects to the actin. When ADP and phosphate are released, the power stroke occurs, which pulls the actin towards the center of the sarcomere. This is actually called the sliding filament theory of contraction that you need to know. Now this is the phase in which tension is increasing, called the contraction phase, in which calcium release exceeds the calcium re Because this is a twitch, only a single action potential is triggered, which actually 
um, has the same degree of calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum activating the same number of cross bridges and producing the same force. As time goes on, the cross bridge formation is decreasing as calcium reuptake exceeds the calcium release and tension decreases. This relaxation phase is the longest of the three phases. As you can see, there's no more action potentials and so calcium will be sequestered, sequestered back into the smooth ER by calcium ATP pump. With calcium going back to its normal levels in the cytoplasm, tropomyosin returns to its blocking position and this whole cycle begins all over again. A twitch is only um, generated in a lab and not in real life because in real life, what actually happens is your muscle will produce tetanus, which is basically maximum tension. The force generated by a single muscle fiber can actually be summated um, with progressively more frequent stimulation, the relaxation period becomes shorter and the maximum tension plateaus um, into what becomes tetanus. In addition to the frequency of uh, stimulation, the fiber diameter also affects the force generated by a single muscle fiber. The more you exercise and the more swole you are, um, the greater the cross-sectional area, which means a greater amount of contractile proteins, which means more cross-bridge formation um, and more tension can be generated. Changing the fiber length can also be a factor of the single muscle. There is an optimum length in which the overlap of actin and mycin allows for maximum cross-bridge formation, but if you constrict it too much, then there will be steric hindrances. Also, if you stretch it too much, there will be less overlap because of the distance, and so less interaction can occur. Decrease the overlap between the actin and the myosin. So there are also some factors that affect the force when the whole muscle is contracted, and that would be the recruitment and the size principle. Different motor units take turns maintaining the muscle tension, um, and so this helps avoid fatigue. The size principle basically states that the small fibers are typically innervated by smaller diameter nerves and vice versa for larger fibers. Two components that make up the muscle include the contractile element that consists of the sarcomeres and play a role in creating tension and cross bridges. The series of elastic element is the portion of the muscle, including the tendons, that merely transmits the force generated by the contractile elements to skeletal components. When the object that you are trying to lift is heavier than the force generated, um, the series elastic element usually lengthens, however, the contractile element shortens. But the whole muscle does not actually change its length. This is called isometric contraction. On the other hand, isotonic contraction um, is when the muscle length shortens and the series elastic element lengthens. As a whole, the muscle um, shortens and is able to lift the load, which is less than the force generated. So that's about all I can cover for skeletal muscles. There's a lot more detail that I wish I could go into, but there's just not enough time, and it's like the day before the human physiology test. So I did this really quickly, so there's probably a lot of mistakes, but I hope you learned a little bit and enjoy the video.